recorded. All right, well, let's get started. So yeah, a huge, huge welcome um, to you all to this talk uh, brought to you tonight uh, by the Shropshire branch of CPRE, uh, the countryside charity as part of their Hedgerow Hero project. Um, my name is Stuart um, and I work as a campaigner at the CPRE National Office um, and I'll be hosting um, this tonight, the sixth of these Zoom, excuse me, the sixth of these Zoom hedge talks uh, where we'll be hearing about the fascinating folklore of our common hedgerow plants with Roy Vickery and we're really, really um, delighted that Roy's joining us tonight. Um, Roy ran uh, two fascinating uh, plant folklore walks last July in Shropshire in person. Um, he is a collector of plant folklore, plant names, herbal uses, sayings, legends and plants that were used to foretell the future. Um, and Roy has written extensively on the plant folklore and his website, uh, Plant Law, is well worth a look. Um, before that, just some quick housekeeping. Um, just so you know, please do um, check out Shropshire's, CPRE Shropshire's website. I will just pop a link to that into the chat right now. Uh, if I can just give me one moment, this pop, there it is. Um, and that you can find a huge amount of valuable resources on hedgerows and how and why we should be protecting them. Uh, there are also uh, free more talks in this present series still available to book covering hedges, trees um, and the planning system as well. Um, and including the, the field names of Shropshire and woodland and biodiversity. Um, and these can be booked on the website. So if you just go to that link, you'll be able to see them and sign up. Um, and there is also now um, a fourth non-hedgerow talk, blasphemy, um, free and open to all, uh, which will be given um, by us, CPR Shrop uh, Shropshire volunteer, Sally Green, um, which will be a follow-up talk um, to the geology of Shropshire, the one that she did previously. Um, this one will be taking place on the 30th of March, and she'll be talking about the Ice Age in Shropshire. So it sounds really, really fascinating and definitely not to be missed. Um, and you can also sign up on the website as that as well. Um, but to, to get early notes of this talk, um, you can also um, sign up for our mailing list on our website. Um, again, you'll to find that through that link um, or email um, Sarah Jameson, um, whose address will we put in the chat. And just one other thing to mention, um, we are still uh, seeking people um, to help us plant new hedges, um, especially on the, the following dates, on, on the 22nd of January, uh, the 12th of February, and the 26th of February. Um, these sites are all in uh, South Shropshire. Um, so you can check out the, the hedge planting page on our website, um, and you can book on the dates there using the online form. Um, or you can contact um, Sarah directly. So yeah, everything um, will all be there um, on the website. So just check out that link that I popped in earlier. Um, and so just before now, I hand over to Roy. Um, I just wanted to quickly just touch on uh, the wider hedgerow campaigning um, that we're doing at the moment at CPRE. Um, so as I mentioned before, I work at the national office and my chief job is leading um, all our hedgerow campaigning that is going on at the moment. Um, so, at, you know, at CPRE, you know, revitalizing uh, our country's hedgerow network is one of our top, top, top priorities. I mean, after all, um, CPRE at its inception was at the heart of some of the first planning and hedgerow legislation. So our campaign at the moment is very, very simple. We know since the Second World War, we've lost half the hedgerows in this country. It's a shocking statistic and barely scraped the surface of the huge environmental biodiversity and sort of losses that we've suffered um, with it. And so we at CPRE, we want to make our hedgerows to make a comeback. Um, and so our chief goal is uh, we're calling for a 40% increase of our hedgerows by 2050, which is a target that we want to see our government put into law. Um, just like we have with trees, we have targets for trees, we'd also see a target for hedgerows as well. Um, and that goal, that number, that's echoed by um, the Independent uh, Climate Change Committee, who see hedgerows as, as, as critical for protecting our countryside and our country as, as a whole um, from climate change and the threats that it poses. So, you know, one of the many benefits of hedgerows for our environment, from um, particularly for, for climate, from a climate perspective, you know, they sequester carbon, they protect endangered species, they, they act as some of nature's flood defenses. Um, but they also offer huge um, economic opportunities as well, which kind of goes a bit under the radar and something we've been talking about a lot recently, 
So in August of last year, we launched our hedge fund reports um, in Parliament, um, which George Eustace, um, the Secretary of State for the Environment, came along to and delivered the keynote speech. Um, and the report found that, amongst other things, that boosting our hedgerows by 40% would create as many as 25,000 jobs in hedge laying and maintenance, so a huge economic benefit there. And that for every one pound invested in hedgerows, as much as three pounds and 92 pence can be generated for the wider economy. So basically, in short, hedgerows pay for themselves. And so it just makes sense to embrace that target and to just plant as, as many hedgerows as we can, really kind of claw back what we lost um, over the last 70 years since the Second World War. And so in the month since that launch, we've been cranking up our campaign to get our government to act. We've got now 50 MPs signed up as hedgerow heroes to champion our um, the hedgerows in Parliament. And we've also been working with across the network as well to, to plant hedgerows as, a, as, a, as, a, as one CPRE um, as well. And we're already kind of seeing the, the dividends of this work. I mean, just, um, just last week, George Eustace declared at the, at the Oxford Farming Conference that hedgerows are probably the single most important ecological building block that we have in the farm landscape. So really, I think it's becoming increasingly known about the benefits that hedgerows are providing us. And we're really trying to make that call as loud and as wide as possible and get as many people on board so that we can see that target happen in law and really revitalize our hedgerow network all over the country. But of course, though, there's still so much to do um, got a lot of big plans this year, and it's uh, wonderful to be with you all today as we work uh, towards making this year uh, the year of the, the, the comeback year for our hedgerows. But that is enough from me. Without further ado, I have the great, great pleasure in handing over to Roy Vickery, who will be talking about the plant folklore of our common, common hedgerow plants. So over to you, Roy. Hello. Can everyone hear and see me okay? Yes, well, as it's been said, I'm Roy Vickery and my great enthusiasm, my, my might say obsession in life, is plants folklore. And I'll start by briefly saying how I got into this subject. It dates back many years now to the early 1980s when I was secretary of the London-based Folklore Society. And at that stage, we were getting a great many new members, but you weren't retaining them very well. So we decided to create a project whereby our members could send in information and get really feel more involved in the society. And me being a botanist from the background, in botany at the Natural History Museum, we decided that this um, survey would consist of collecting information on plants which people consider to be unlucky if they're picked or taken indoors. And the main one of these plants was hawthorn, and I've been collecting plant folklore ever since. Um, this survey, which ran from 1982 to 1984, collected information on about um, 70 different plants which different people thought were unlucky in one way or another. And it also revealed that people had a great uh, urge to record the plants law which they knew. So in addition to getting information on plants which considered to be unlucky, uh, people also sent in a great deal of information about when they sowed various crops and when they used plants to treat illnesses, et cetera, et cetera. So the main uh, plant which was considered to be unlucky when people took indoors was hawthorn. Firing hawthorn was considered very unlucky if you took it indoors. Obviously, most hawthorns are not firing this time of year, but it has a twig with a fruit on it, a horn. It. And we collected some nice stories about that. In one case, an unpopular school teacher in Surrey brought hawthorn blossom indoors and decorated her schoolroom with it. And that evening, she fell downstairs broke the leg. Another e story at the same time was of an aunt who brought hawthorn indoors, decorated a house with it, and that evening her ceiling collapsed, ruining, ruining her favourite tea set. And I think if nothing else this shows how superstition keeps going, 
you only need a coincidence that suddenly people think, ah, oh, there's something in it after all. Uh, you won't bring Hawthorne indoors. And there have been various explanations of why Hawthorne shouldn't be taken indoors. Uh, one was associated with the Virgin Mary. And if you were taking it indoors, then you were suspected of being a Catholic, which you might be persecuted. But in fact, the association of the Virgin Mary with the month of May, and consequently May Blossom, May Hawthorne, uh, dates back to the 19th century. So this really happened after um, the major, um, major persecutions of the Catholics were, was over. So I don't think that means much. Another idea was that Hawthorne made Christ crown of thorns, but Hawthorne, as we get in the British Isles, does not grow in the Middle East. So that's important as well. I think the real reason is that Hawthorne flowers, at a certain stage in their development, smell of decaying flesh. And although today we may not be aware of the smell of decaying flesh, obviously in earlier times before people had refrigerators, uh, they were well aware of what decaying flesh meat going off smelt like. And also, of course, they kept corpses indoors for up to a week to make sure whoever was dead was truly dead and they weren't going to be buried alive. So I think that is why Hawthorne was considered to be unlucky when it was taken indoors. And the other thing which about Hawthorne is that people did collect and eat the young leaves, and this was known as bread and cheese. Of course, it tasted nothing like bread and cheese, but I think it just got its name because that was the farm worker's traditional snack he took with him to the fields when he was doing his work. And I got one very nice story about this from a woman who uh, grew up in Lancashire during the Second World War. And that was a time when food in general was scarce. And her friend was the daughter of the local baker. So occasionally she got sort of spare biscuits and things passed away. And so it was a good friend to have. And then one day, this girl said to her friend, I know where we can get bread and cheese. So they got on their bike and cycled away. And then they eventually ended up at a Hawthorne hedge. And this was the bread and cheese. And uh, the woman who told me the story was so disappointed that she never again really regained her friendship with the baker's daughter. Another thing about Hawthorne is that in uh, the continent, particularly in France, it is used to treat heart conditions. And I have got uh, several uh, records of old farm people or old countrymen who were going around the walking around, they would chew a hawthorn twig as it went round. And there's no reason why they should have chosen a hawthorn twig. But I do wonder whether this was a sort of self-medication, were they actually medicating themselves uh, to prevent heart conditions. So that's hawthorn. And incidentally, uh, more recently, I did do a smaller survey on, on lucky plants, plants which people thought we were unlucky for one reason or another. And Hawthorne is still at the top, followed by lilac, two strongly scented plants. So that is uh, where the current situation is. People still remember these things as being unlucky. And the proportion of one to the other hasn't changed over the years. Uh, don't look too closely at this one, please. I thought I brought some elder indoors. But in fact, I see now looking at it more closely, it's ash. Um, elder was another thing which people considered to be unlucky. If you took it indoors, the flowers indoors, then various misfortunes would happen to you. And um, elder is a very enigmatic plant in the folk tradition. Uh, some people considered it to be a good plant because uh, good fairies, protective beings, lived in elder branches. And therefore, if you had an elder tree growing outside your house, you wouldn't destroy it because that would mean the good fairies, the protective beings, would desert you and go and help your neighbour instead of helping and protecting you. Alternatively, elder was sometimes associated with witches. 
And if you harmed an elder tree, then you might harm the local witch. And sometimes there are stories of um, people trying to hit elder trees. The next day, there was an elderly woman in the village with her leg bandage because she'd been damaged when she was in the form of an elder tree. So you wouldn't destroy an elder tree because you didn't want to upset the good beings and you didn't want to upset the bad beings either. But I think there was some sort of logic behind this because it meant that um, whether you feared the, losing the good fairies or you feared upsetting the local witches, you didn't destroy an elder tree. And I think that is simply because elder trees were so valuable. They had so many uses. And during the 1940s, during the Second World War, when people were re-examining the uh, herbal traditions of the British Isles, because uh, before both World Wars, we were very dependent on Germany for our herbs. So obviously when the wars came along, we could get, not get herbs imported from Germany. So we had to re-examine our own herbal traditions. And of course, people went out and things like rose hips and uh, did um, foxglove, etc. But anyway, two speak, uh, writers speaking at that time had a very high opinion of elder. And one said elder has the unusual distinction of being useful in every part. And another said, quoted a gypsy friend of hers, who said, elder be the healingest tree that on earth do grow. And it was said until recently that all uh, human ailments, apart from constipation, can be treated using elder. Uh, then about three years ago, I was giving a talk to the Hertfordshire Herb Group, and they're mainly practicing herbalists. And one of them said that I use elder leaves to treat constipation. So it now appears that elder can be used to treat everything. Uh, if I do give any cures in the course of this talk, I'm only telling them to you as they've been told to me. Don't necessarily follow them up and think they're going to work. They could be good, they could be bad. We don't know. I've just collected things. I haven't evaluated them. Another thing about elder was it was supposed to keep flies away. So you would plant it around your, outside your toilets, outside your slaughterhouses, uh, anywhere you want to keep flies away, and it's meant to deter flies. Or you could put in your horses harnesses to keep flies away from your horses. Uh, it had lots of medicinal uses, as I've already said. The leaves could be boiled up in lard and used, sorry, the berries could be boiled up in lard and used to treat a piles. Um, the, the wine made from the berries could be used uh, each night to try and prevent codes and similar sort of ailments. And so it had all sorts of uses. And of course, elder does have hollow stems, or at least it has pith in the middle. And you push this pith out, and then you have a, a tube, a solid tube, a rigid tube. And these could be made into pea shooters or whistles, even though today, according to the internet, um, Elder whistles are poisonous, but obviously generations of children did make them without coming to any harm. And there is one record from Ireland where if you were going on a long journey, so if you take anything with you, which is a value, you would get an elder um, trunk, push the pith out and fill it with mol molten lead. And then when the lead uh, solidified, you'll take this with you. And should you be attacked, then you would have a good strong cosh to uh, fight back with. That's another use of elder. Elderberries were thrown into streams by anglers who were fishing for coarse fish, and then the fish would come and eat the elderberries and uh, you'd be able to pull them out of the water. So that is some of the many uses of elder. Well, as I said, when I was talking about elder earlier, I was really demonstrating it, I'll show you ash. Uh, this is ash with its black uh, martyr shaped buds. Um, ash had various uses. Um, if you um, had earache, you would get an ash twig, hold it over a flame, and then the sap would bubble out at the end. As you collect this on cotton wool, and you put the cotton wool in your ear, and this was supposed 
to cure earache. Um, ashen faggots were burnt at Christmas time, particularly on Age Christmas Eve in Devon and Somerset and Dorset. And the idea was you've got a bundle of big ash trees, tied them up, usually using brambles to tie them round, and then you would burn them on the fire. And you had several of these uh, bramble brands amongst the uh, faggots. And as it one of these broke, you had a drink. And this survives in one or two pubs in Devon and Dorset. I have seen it at the Squirrel Inn uh, on the Dorset Somerset Water at Laymore. And uh, it's quite interesting because they have this packet burn at one end of the pub, and everyone is gathering around the bar down the other end, and the packet burns, but no one really takes much notice of it. However, there is an interesting superstition down there, which seems to be sort of held quite strongly, that if a woman steps over this faggot while it is burning, then she will become pregnant. Uh, this seems to be quite a recent idea, which people down there still do seem to believe. And these um, burning the ashen faggots seem to be particularly prevalent in the early 19th century. And uh, in Devil, in Cor sorry, in Somerset at least, they had ashen faggot balls which people attended, and it was attended by the aristocracy, or at least the um, upper class townspeople. So that was another use of ash. Um, in parts of the southeast on the Hampshire, Sussex border, and in Surrey and in Middlesex, uh, children, boys, wore ash twigs in their socks on Ash Wednesday. And if you were not doing this, then you would have your feet stamped on. You had to wear ash in your socks, tucked into your socks on Ash Wednesday before 12 o'clock in the morning. Then at 12 o'clock at noon, uh, you no longer need to do it. You threw it out of the window. And uh, this uh, practice seems to have really, really started in around about the 1930s and since continued to the 1960s. So it wasn't a practice which took place for long, but uh, it certainly is remembered by lots of people, particularly in the Crowborough area. So that was another thing which people did with ash. Um, and ash wood uh, dry burns, whether it's wet or whether it's dry. So it's good wood for burning. You don't need to season it. Let it dry out before you burn it. So it said, ash wet or ash dry, a king may warm his slippers by. So that was ash, some of the uses and some of the folklore associated with ash. Here we have ivy, a plant which I think everyone knows. One of the surprising things about ivy was it was used to treat foot and mouth disease. And of course, we haven't had any outbreaks of foot and mouth disease in Great Britain since I think it was 2007. But when they do occur, it is thought essential to kill all the affected animals and all the animals on the farm, or the cows at least, or the I assume all the sheep as well, I don't know. So it is a very um, feared disease amongst dairy farmers and beef farmers. But there are quite a lot of um, traditional cures for foot and mouth disease. And one of these was feeding the animals on ivy, which was meant to cure them. Or alternatively, you didn't need to feed the animals on ivy. They simply sorted out themselves, ate it, and this cured them of foot and mouth, mouth disease. And it is said that ivy, if you have a sick sheep, then you tempt it by feeding it with ivy. And if it shows interest in the ivy, if it eats the ivy, then it will survive and live happily. If it doesn't eat the ivy, then it's going to die. So you load it up in your cart, take it off to the local slaughterhouse, and try to get it there while it's still alive, because selling it live 
is worth is worth something once it's dead it's worth virtually nothing so that was another thing people did with ivy um ivy was also used to treat corns if you have a corn on your foot on your toes you get an ivy leaf you wrap it round tie it up and leave it there for about three nights and then you take it off and the corn lifts up its roots more and you're never troubled again but that is about the only other remedy which I've ever tried. And it actually worked very well for me. So that is a remedy which I think is safe and which you can try if you unfortunately need to use it. Ivy was also used on washing days. Uh, you would get ivy leaves, boil them up, so you had a sort of greenish uh, liquid, and then you would dab this on the greasy parts of clothing or just generally dab it on to clean up clothing. And this seems to be particularly um, used if your husband wore blue serge uniforms. And of course, uh, what should we say, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, anyone who wore uniforms, whether they were railway porters or policemen, whatever, wore blue serge uniforms. So you would get this and you would you dab the ivy solution on the um, greasy parts of the, of the uniform, particularly, and just lift the grease off and leave it nice and clean. And it's also said that by using ivy in this way, uh, you would, um, when the trousers were ironed later, the trousers were not very shiny, because of course, just say people who iron trousers, they're very trousers trousers today, um, they did worry about the trousers being shiny. And as I've mentioned, um, foot and mouth, and I mentioned ash earlier, another cure for foot and mouth is feeding your cattle on ash as well. So that is one of several cures for foot and mouth disease. So ivy had uses medicinally, and there is some controversy about whether ivy berries can be eaten. Most people regard them as being poisonous, I have got one or two records of people who regularly ate ivy berries, not too many, just one or two each day. And this suggests that as they sort of deliberately ate one or two each day, they did think that it did them some good, but what good it did them, I don't know. So that's ivy. And also, of course, ivy was used in Christmas decorations. And like many Christmas decorations, it was considered unlucky to bring ivy in before Christmas Eve, and it should be taken out by Twelfth Night. Which brings us on to the main Christmas plant, holly. Uh, holly is, of course, was at least, of course, the main plant associated with Christmas, particularly before we had Christmas trees. And in my own family, uh, my mother's parents who farmed on the Dorset Devon Somerset border, uh, they would always bring holly in as a Christmas tree. So we didn't have a fir tree, we had a holly bush stuck in one corner of the room. I remember I went to visit my grandparents on Boxing Day. Uh, this tree was sat there in the corner of the room, decorated. And one of the strange things was that the children were entertained on Christmas on Boxing Day afternoon, I given, being given balloons. And you can imagine what happens, the combination of children with balloons and a big holly tree bush put in one corner of the room. So holly was used as a Christmas tree. And I think it still is used as a Christmas tree in Cornwall. Uh, and uh, holly was eaten by cows to a certain extent. You had to, uh, I believe in Derbyshire there are sort of holly orchards which were there for cows to eat. And uh, another use of holly was for sweeping chimneys. You get a bunch of holly, tie a rope around it, drop the end of the rope down the chimney, pull the end, and then it would come down the chimney, pulling all the uh, debris or the soot with it. So that's another use of holly. Uh, holly could be used to treat chillblains, which fortunately not so many people get today, but it was a common winter uh, ailment or 
discomfort every year that I was a child. And you could uh, cure your children by beating them with holly as they bled. And this is meant to get your circulation going and cure your children. I never tried that. And I don't actually know if anyone who has tried it, but um, that's what people said. So that's holly. Another thing which we might find in our hedgerows is yew. Um, yew is poisonous in most plant parts, but the arils, the pink bits, the reddish pink bits around the seeds can eat them, be eaten. They were widely eaten by children uh, who appreciated them a lot. Because when we think back, nowadays we're all um, addicted to sugar, and so, so much of our food is sweet. But if you go back to before sugar became abundant, uh, then children were rather short of sweet things to eat. So to get these yew arils and eat them, and they do taste quite pleasantly sweet. Um, you have to avoid eating seeds because seeds are poisonous, like the rest of the tree. And these were widely eaten by children, and they're known as such names as red snot or snotty cobs. Because if you do try to eat them, they have got a very viscous uh, texture and they stick to your hands and uh, stick to everything else they touch. So uh, people did eat yew arrows. And I have been told that you can make uh, jam from these yew arrows, because I have no idea how you do it. I've never found a recipe, and I've no idea how you extract the seeds and prevent the seeds, the poison of the seeds seeping into your jam. Uh, as everyone knows, you is associated with church charts, and uh, there's all sorts of explanations for this. Uh, one explanation is that it was planted there because it was poisonous and therefore farmers would not allow their cattle to get into the churchyard because they didn't want eating the poisonous you. Um, Another explanation was that it was um, put there so people could make long bows from it. Uh, but that doesn't seem to work. It said that British use are not good for long bows. Uh, and then, of course, there's lots of nonsense written about you being a sacred tree, sacred to the Jews, sacred to more or less any primitive religious group you can name. And that's why it was recurred in, in churchyards. It was said that it was the, um, often the ewe was there first and that sanctified the area and then the church was built beside the ewe. But I think there's absolutely no um, real um, truth in that. And it's very difficult to date the um, age of the ewe because they go hollow inside, so you can't take a core and count the rings or anything like that, because, or do um, dendrochronology of the centre, because the centre has invariably rotted away. So you can measure the perimeter and then sort of try to calculate. I don't think this is accurate. And around about the millennium, David Bellamy fronted a programme which was trying to promote use and stuff like go to church house in Shropshire and elsewhere. And you see this says that David Bellamy has um, certified that that you was X thousand years old. Um, but uh, in fact, it's now been thought that the way that group were uh, dating ewes was inaccurate. And most ewes are far younger than Bellamy uh, and his colleagues suggested. And indeed, um, Bellamy himself did more or less suggest that he wasn't being accurate there. He was just sort of doing this because it was good to get people uh, involved. Uh, so that's you, um, yeah, in churchyards, no one's quite sure why. It is said that possibly it's a symbol of um, everlasting life, eternal life. <laughs> it is also said that it did help cleanse the air in churchyards. Uh, this odd object, is the root of white bryony, Bryonia dioica, which is an interesting plant because it is the only native member, only, 
only member of the cucumber family, Ducucabitaceae, which is native to Great Britain. Uh, so it's has this large woody root, rather like a distorted uh, parsnip. This root here is very old. It was collected about 40, 45 years ago. Uh, so it's really shriveled completely now. And then it produces these um, shoots cut to the top which grow very rapidly and spread through hedgerows wherever else they can spread. I did introduce one to my tiny garden in London some years ago, and it's a great mistake because it now swamps everything. Anyway, from the folklore point of view, these are the things which were often considered to be mandrakes in the British Isles because we don't have mandrakes in the British Isles apart from one or two botanical gardens. They're quite hardy, but uh, they're not native to Britain, and uh, you don't often see them cultivated either. So these things look rather like mandrakes, and they were usually, if someone shows you a mandrake and it originated in the British Isles, it is a white brown root. And one thing they would do to try and make these things look rather more um, human, was they would scrape the or a hole in here and then put um, wheat seed or some other cereal seeds in there, let them germinate and then dry off. So it looks as though the head up here was producing pear. And in East Anglia, they would collect these roots and then in the local pubs each year, they'd have a competition to see who had the best mandrake, the mandrake which most is resembled a man in shape. And I think they also had similar competitions for women drakes, which were these things, but they wanted to look like a woman, rather, shaped like a woman rather than a man. And uh, these mandrake roots, when they were dried, presumably not dried for 40 years, they were used for conditioning horses. Uh, the people would keep a mandrake root hung up in their stables and then they would scrape bits off and add it to the horse's food, and this would keep the horse in good condition. So that is white brownie, also known as English mandrake. A hazel. Hazel um, had a lot of uses because it's a very flexible wood and it can be bent easily, and it can be also be split easily. Um, so it was used for wattle in Dorban wattle walls. Uh, it was used to make sheep hurdles. It was made by gypsies made close pegs from them. Uh, and uh, while talking of gypsies, I was recently reading about gypsies who camped on Wands of Common near where I live in London. When they camped there in the 19th century, uh, we always think of gypsies as having these beautiful ornate caravans, but most of the gypsies who lived on Wands of Common lived in what were known as benders, and simply they had um, a large piece of tr tree trunk, not trunk, slightly smaller trunk, slightly bigger than a, a twig, and they'd bend this and then they'd throw a tarpaulin over it, and that is what they slept under. So most, lots of gypsies, even if they had elaborate caravans, would also have these benders, which they slept in. And it was usually a bent um, hazel stem, which provided support for the tarpaulin. And I believe this was also used as a shelter for the Greenham women who were protesting against the uh, military site in Greenham. Uh, hazel catkins were considered to be associated with um, luck with your sheep. If you brought hazel indoors, uh, then you would have bad luck with, with your sheep. That's hazel with male catkins. It was believed really, you'd have bad luck with your lambing. As you said that each um, hazel cat can represent a, sh a lamb's tail. So uh, therefore you had to be careful how you treated hazel because you didn't want to um, lose your lambs. And similarly, there were similar beliefs about primroses. If you brought less than 13 primroses indoors, then your 
hens which are sitting on eggs would not hatch. The eggs would not hatch well. Uh, 13 was the traditional number of eggs to put under a hen, so you have at least 13 primroses said to have 13 chicken hatch out of those 13 eggs. And um, I have spoken to people who remember their mothers in the clip around the year because they brought in too many, too few primroses early in the spring. Uh, hazelnuts were tremendously important in the rural economy. People collected them to sell, uh, you know, for nuts and confectionery. And the shells were also valued as a source of tannin for tanning. So they were very important in rural um, wooded areas. Lots of people went out and collected them each autumn, and it was a useful source of cottagers family income keeping them going during the winter. But now, of course, with the introduction of the grey squirrel from North America, uh, very few hazelnuts actually reach maturity, so we can no longer do this. Even though I think, at least in South East England, during the last five or six years, more hazelnuts have been reaching maturity than they have in the past. So I don't know why this is. It could be something to do with climate change. I certainly haven't noticed any diminution of the squirrel population. But uh, that is hazel. And I've talked about uh, hazel and lambs, lambs, um, primroses and chicken. And the other one was um, elder, no, sorry, not elder, willow flower, flowering willow, pussy willow, uh, grey willow, palm, whatever you want to call it. And if you brought that indoors, then you might have bad luck with your goslings. The idea being that each um, yellow male flower was somewhat resembled a young gosling. So that's a hazel, also willow and um, primroses in passing. This is bramble, and as you know, brambles uh, make these arches which loop around and make massive arches, it can be massive arches. And when it reaches the ground, the shoot uh, takes root and then you get a new bramble plant. So that's one of the ways which brambles reproduce. And there's a lot of folklore associated with these bramble arches, um, not dating back I believe before the early 19th century. So it doesn't seem to be particularly ancient, this, these beliefs. But if you crawled under one of these bramble arches, you placed, uh, placed a child underneath it, then this would cure all sorts of ailments. Um, usually it was whooping cough on the English Welsh border. If you crawled under one of these bramble arches, uh, seven times uh, for seven mornings, say it's sunrise, then you would be cured of your whooping cough. And I think what happened here was sometimes it worked, sometimes we got was just going anyway. Other times um, it didn't work. And then you could usually sort of think about it, think, well, actually, on Tuesday morning we were a bit late, but had we got in time, no doubt everything would have gone well and the child would have been cured. Uh, but in Cornwall, you could crawl through a bramble arch to treat blackheads. And elsewhere, you could crawl through a bramble arch to treat hernias and rickets. So it was used to treat a wide range of ailments. And in Ireland, there are two records in the 1930s of people crawling through bramble arches, and then they got good luck playing cards. But they got good luck in this life, but then when they died, the devil came and drained their soul. And about 10, 15 years ago, I was leading a walk in Brompton Cemetery in London, and I stopped to talk about brambles. And an elderly woman there said, when I was a child in Ireland, if we had a big card match in the village, everyone crawled onto these bramble arches, because they wanted to get good luck playing cards. And I said, well, won't they be afraid of being carried away by the devil later? 
And she said, no, they just wanted the money, they just wanted to win. But of course, if everyone in the village did this, then, um, you know, the playing field was level, so no one really benefited from it. And there are records from uh, Sussex and elsewhere from the 19th century, I think. I think it's the 19th century. Uh, if you had a sick cow, and obviously it might be difficult to drive the cow through a bramble arch, you would cut the bramble arch and wrap it around the cow. And this was supposed to cure the cow of its ailment. And I don't know what the cow was suffering from, but apparently if you wrap the bramble arch around a cow, then this would cure the cow of its ailment. And of course, from brambles, we get blackberries. Uh, one of the fruits which is collected more or less everywhere, people even in London, in Hyde Park and Christie Gardens, collect blackberries each year. And blackberries should, in theory, not be eaten after Michaelmas Day, because it was believed that on Michaelmas Day, uh, the devil either spat or urinated on um, blackberries, so thereafter they were no good to eat. And certainly in South East England, uh, they're well past their prime. I think it was the 29th of September. But um, if you go further north, in Shropshire, for example, I'm sure, uh, the, brambles are, the bram blackberries are still perfectly good and perfectly edible uh, well after Michaelmas Day. And I was in uh, Leicestershire, sort of around about early October this year, and there's certainly lots of healthy, good seconds, uh, blackberries still left there. I'm sure they could still be eaten. So that's um, Bramble. And to finish off with, I think we'll finish off with my favourite plant when I'm doing talks or leading walks, that is stinging nettle. I like stinging nettles because it's everywhere. And wherever I'm doing a walk, I can find stinging nettles to talk about. And one thing about steam nettles was that um, if you ate three meals of steam nettles each spring, then you would, this would cleanse your blood and you'll stay healthy for the rest of the year. And uh, so you get the tops of steam nettles like this, either make them into a soup or, um, or uh, treat them like spinach. A traditional way of eating them in Ireland was to get them, chop them up, and then when you're making mashed potato, you would throw them into your mashed potatoes, and there's enough heat in the potatoes you're mashing up to kill the sting in the stinging nettle. And uh, those of us who grew up in rural areas in the 1950s and earlier can probably remember the time, which, were bit, which, which was a bit grim, sort of around about March, April, when there's nothing left in your vegetable garden. A few carrots which passed their best, um, possibly a few, uh, a few uh, root crops would also pass their best. My father didn't like onions, he didn't have onions. Uh, so no doubt if you went out at that time of year, around about Easter time, and had three meals of nettles, this would add trace minerals and vitamins and things to your diet and would make you feel better even if it didn't actually cleanse your blood. There are records in Scotland in the early 19th century of people on the big estates there growing nettles under glass, so they had an early spring vegetable. So nettles were valued as food. They're also fed to young turkeys because before um, antibiotics were discovered, um, young turkeys would suddenly sicken and die. So you get young nettles, chop them up and add them to your turkey food. And this would keep your turkeys healthy. And uh, this was certainly done in Ireland. It was done in England. And I have a friend who lived in North Italy uh, and he who's a bit older than me. And he remembers doing this to feed his parents turkeys when he was a child. So it seems to be a widespread um, idea that you fed nettles to turkeys uh, to keep them healthy. Uh, the most widespread use of nettles in, health, in keeping people healthy today is to use, is used to treat uh, rheumatism. And if you have rheumatism, 
you would beat yourself with nettles or get someone to beat you with nettles. And this would presume, would, would uh, cure your rheumatism. And I got a very nice story sent to me about 10 years ago, probably longer ago, for a woman who was a district nurse, a midwife in the Lake District. And uh, there was a man in the village who could not do his milking. And his wife had to do milking every morning because he could not get up because he had this terrible pain in his back. So his wife went to the local herbalist and said, what can I do to treat my husband's back? And the herbalist said, you get a bunch of nettles, a bunch of thyme, and a bunch of clock leaves, tie them together and beat your husband's back with it. And surprisingly enough, the husband agreed to this. She was lying on the bed with his back exposed and his wife started beating away. And possibly she got carried away or something with her frustration. But according to the woman who wrote to me, some of the nettles fell on the farmer's private parts, fell on his private, private parts. He leapt out of bed screaming, shouting, cursing his wife and cursing the local herbalist and he did the milking forevermore. So it did work. Uh, another use of nettles was to get fibres from them. Uh, fibres from nettles are very hard to extract. So it's a good, strong, long fibre, but difficult to extract. So most things which are described as nettle fibres, made of nettle fibres, in fact, are mainly made of flax, with possibly a few strands of nettle fibre mixed in. And nettles are good against um, allergies. Uh, some years ago, I was speaking to a woman who had a pet cat and she was allergic to cats, but she found if she drank a mug of nettle tea each morning, then she would happily eat a group of cats. So I think that's given you some idea of the folklore and uses of plants which occur in hedgerows. Um, but I think it also gives you some idea of how people viewed hedgerows years ago. There were a resource. You walked along and you looked at things and thought, how can I use that? I'll burn it. I'll um, use a sweeping chimney. Uh, I can cure my chill blades with it. Uh, I can find games for my children or whatever. So if we go back, say, to around about the 1920s, when more people lived in rural areas and they had these, needed these things of necessity, I think they saw their hedgerows very differently than we did today. So that's all I have to say in my formal talk. If anyone has any questions or comments or anything, I'm pleased to try and answer them. Well, thank you so, so much, Roy. That was absolutely riveting. I, I, I really, really enjoyed that. That was so much information that, that I never heard before. And just going to the depths of this, plants I, I now have a very long list of plants never to bring inside my flats so that that's also a very good thing lest uh bad luck before me um but actually one, one thing actually i was also looking um over your website and I, it was really interesting to see a mention of um a woman who lives near me in, in tooting who passed away who was used to live on on, on the bench there for many years and, and I, on your website it was, it was wonderful to see all the kind of talks you do about all the different flowers and, and things like that so yeah thank you um so so much for that um, so please do, if you have any questions, um, please do pop them in the chat. Um, just, just one for me was just um, over the years, you know, you, you've been studying plants. I, I, I wondered if you've kind of noticed um, a change um, as a result of our changing climate, how, how that might have affected them. If, if you visibly able to see that kind of impact over the years or whether, or whether it's been a bit more subtle. It's hard to say what is changing our plant population. I mean, one thing, for example, is lots of nitrogen is being sloshed around at present, which increases the nettle population and the amount of car paths we see beside our roads. So it's not climate, it's other things going on at the same time. Um, I did mention ivy, and ivy is the only um, native member of the family Aureliaceae, which is essentially a tropical family. But I think ivy is doing extraordinarily well at the moment. It's 
climbing up trees, it's spreading on the woodland floors. And I find it rather worrying because I think it's some places forcing out uh, things like the primroses and the daffodils, which we enjoy in the springtime. And uh, I think uh, that is the main change I'm seeing. I think Ivy is doing exceedingly well at the moment and I'm rather worried about it. Thank you. Um, so there's actually a question um, from Becky in the chat. I don't know, Becky, if, if maybe you'd like to un unmute yourself um, and, ask, and ask for your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, great. Um, I just wondered um, why you think we stopped using nettle, given that it's so readily available. Because I remember the first time I made nettle soup for myself a couple of years ago and I was so surprised it tastes just like spinach to me I thought it was really nice so I don't know why we would have stopped using it. I agree with you I think it's rather better than spinach I much prefer the texture of nettles rather than spinach. Um, I think it was just considered to be sort of you know a sign of poverty to go out and collect nettles I mean you know I've had people write to me say when I was very hard up I used to go out and collect nettles and I think when they um then they, then they had a bit of money. They didn't like to be seen eating nettles. And of course, there are stories about um, people in Germany after the Second World War in Berlin, you know, being dependent on nettles uh, for food. So I think, you know, there's a thing about, uh, you know, we didn't want to see them eating nettles because we're, that's something that we are poverty stricken. On the other hand, I have been to places like Bushy Park in uh, near Hampton Court. And to um, big cemetery in South London, whose name I've forgotten, uh, Nunhead Cemetery. And if you walk along the paths there, all of the um, nettles, sort of around about April time, have been um, lost their growing shoots because people have gone along and cut them down. So there is quite a lot of foraging going on these days. So it's come back into um, use. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, a question from um, Kirsty. I don't know, maybe Kirsty, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself um, and ask what your question. And if not, uh, I, I can ask a question. Um, for, it's just if you had one recommendation for plant use that's still relevant today, uh, what would it be? Well, uh, I'm quite uh, keen on eating nettles. And uh, I'm also, as I said, you know, I have used um, ivy leaves to remove a corn and it did work. So I can recommend that. Uh, I think I haven't really got any particular plant use I would recommend. I think just go out there and use anything which is safe you're not going to benefit possibly much from it, but you're going to relate more closely to the natural world simply by collecting plants and using it. And I think that's a good thing, re-establishing a connection with the natural world rather than benefiting a great deal from what you've collected. Could I comment on Mark Norman's question, please? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in Sting Nettle Day, the calendar custom in Devon. Uh, because I did collect quite a lot of this information on this some years ago. Uh, Sting Nettle Day was the 2nd of May. Uh, the 1st of May was Ducking Day when people threw water or squirted water over each other. The 2nd of May was Sting Nettle Day. And the 3rd of May was Petticoat Day when boys tried to chase girls and see their petticoats. And this custom was interesting because it took place in the Torbay area of Devon. It also took place in part of the Norfolk coast as well, so it had a disjunct distribution. And here again, I think like the weighing of ash on Ash Wednesday, it wasn't, a, didn't exist for a long period. It seems to have started sometime sort of early in the 20th century, and it died out um, just before or just, or during the Second World War. Um, if Mark has any later um, records, I'm very pleased to learn of them. Thank you. 
Thanks, Roy. And just so no more questions in the chat at the moment, but if you are, do have any, please do pop them in. But just just actually one, one more for me was just, um, have you kind of noticed uh, a greater interest in kind of people's relationship to the natural world, to nature, or to nature in general, um, as a result of COVID? I guess I'm thinking of people being more stuck inside and maybe a bit appreciating access to green space and things like that. Is that something you've, you, you've noticed over the last couple of years of that kind of interest rising in that? I'm not sure that it is really. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it. Um, but no, I think people go out and get their daily exercise. Some of them communicate with nature, some of them don't, some them just trudge around. Uh, plugged into whatever they're listening to and not looking left or right. Um, no, lots of people say it is, but I think one thing which I have noticed, not relating to plants, is that I've been feeding my birds in my garden for many years. And I'm now getting far fewer birds in my garden. And I think that is because lots of other people locally are feeding the birds, so the birds don't want to come to eat my cheap bird seed when they're getting um, Harrods bird seed up the road. Uh, that's the only thing I think I've noticed, yes. I haven't noticed a great... I mean, I do lots of walks and talks and things, and I haven't noticed a great, greater uptake of people on my walks than I did in the past, yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah, you, uh, you can't compete with that Harrods birdseed. Um, and I, I did actually see you, you did one on, on Tooting Common, which is just around the corner from me, which is a place that I... I run around regularly, so I'd be very interested one day, if you did one of those ghosts to, to come along to one of those um, and learn more about um, the park and the area. Um, but if, if there's no more, more questions um, for Roy, then I just want to say just a huge, huge thank you once again um, for that talk. I, I personally, I, I found it absolutely riveting. It's a huge amount of things that I'd never heard about, that I didn't know about hedgerows, about the plants that inhabit them, and all the kind of, particularly kind of the the folk stories and the superstitions behind them all um, as well it was fascinating to hear and think how things got their names and things like that. So yeah, just like to say a huge, huge thank you, um, Roy, and also to everyone else who, who joined us this evening um, and came along. Really, really do appreciate um, you spending your Wednesday evening with us. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a number of other talks that will be taking place over the coming weeks and months. So please do sign up for them and we'd love to see you there too. So yeah. On behalf of, of CPR Shropshire, a huge, huge um, thanks. And um, yeah, have a lovely evening. Bye, everyone. <laughs>